Admiral Two Star Bill Stoppelfield. Good morning again, Rob. Great Mary to Lawrence be here. All Star. Good morning. Rob, we were talking about 9-11. We all remember where we were in 9-11, but I have a story that a few days after 9-11, uh, we had a lady in our community, Jane Downey, who died this past Friday. Uh, through her career, she was a physical therapist, and she was one, one of the better-known physical therapists around. After the Sunday after 9-11 at, our, at the church, she sang God Bless America. And Rob, to this day, I cannot I cannot remember a more moving tribute and how that church was just fixed with her beautiful voice and the patriotism that was just boiling over. It was a memory that I will forever cherish, and Jane was a wonderful friend, a wonderful lady. We're going to miss a great deal. So, Very good, Admiral. Much appreciated uh, you bringing that up. It was really uh, – Again, Bill saying that reminds me, and some of the folks on the chat have talked about just what um, an incredible time it was, the community sort of coming together. Um, uh, you know, there were, there were church services, there were um, people wanting to do more in terms of volunteering, there were blood drives all over the place. Um, it it was good coming out of a really evil thing that mm -hmm. had happened, and it lasted for I don't know, a couple of days. I'm kidding. No, no, no more, it was way more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, way more than that. Yeah. But it was, um, you know, the the feeling just pervaded almost everything that um, we just need to do something, and people were inclined to want to do something good. Yeah, so. let me philosophically, you're right, Maria. We all felt good. We felt bonded. And the numbers have been six, seven months and then kind of dissipated. Second World War was another experience. But that coming together lasted quite a bit longer. Have we changed to the point that we're incapable of having this close bonding as a nation? Or have we become so polarized that we'll not have that sense of togetherness like we had at, uh, during during and after the Second World War. Well, Don't you, know. you would hope you would never have to go and find that out yeah, uh, right. for another World War yeah. because it would be fought in a much different way and not the way World War II was fought at all. But World War II was such a collective effort. Uh, if you were of fighting age, you were fighting. And if you were a, a female and you, you weren't in some, tor some type of supportive services, you were in the factory working because your husband or boyfriend or son or whatever was overseas doing what they were doing. So everybody uh, went Pitched through it. In. You went through the rationing. And, right? and you went through the victory gardens, which were actually real gardens that were promoting the food on the table. Yes. And so everybody, everybody was in it together. And it was a different time, too. There was no Internet. So if you were a dissenter, if you were a person who believed in conspiracy theories, you didn't have a way of connecting with all of your other folks and having your loud voice heard and interrupting other things. So it wasn't all that long after 9-11 that the conspiracy theorists came out and began saying that George Bush bombed the World Trade Center and brought it down, that there was never an airplane that hit the Pentagon. If there was, where'd it go? How come you always see the tail fin uh, or a wing or whatever it was? Uh, and there are people to this day who believe that 9-11 was an inside job. Bush did it. Yeah. And and that is what began the tearing down of the unity of the country. And then the Iraq war took care of the rest of it. And here we are today. I had and a 9 11 is really kind of been a This is Michael for me. Hornby, by the way. Yeah. Michael. Good. Who gets to say something yeah. every now well, and again. <laughs> it's my son's birthday, too. 9 11 is his birthday. So, uh, you know, Dex. He, happy 15th birthday to Dexter today. Um, so. I always remember where I was in 9/11, yeah. but you know, 10 years later, I became pull well, that uh, closer to you, Michael. It became my son was born, so it, sure. it, it's one of those things where it, it, it's a bittersweet day for for our family. Mm -hmm. And when you were talking about World War II, I my fa one of my favorite pictures of my mom, who was a welder during the war, Rosie is the Riveter, huh? yeah, of her and her best friend Franny, and they have their arms around each other and they're smiling, and they just finished a shift. Um, you know, and, and exactly what you said. I mean, people just felt compelled to, um, to do what they could much the same mm. way as we did, 
um, on 9-11, after 9-11. I had, I had three uncles that were in World War II. By some miracle, they all came home, which is amazing. And then shortly after that, uh, two others uh, went into the service. I think my father went in in the 50s. Uh, he was born in 33, so I, I think it was somewhere in the early 50s. He ended up going, being drafted into the Army. And, and th that's what happened back then. You got drafted, and everybody kind of had that collective. You we, went. We, everybody, mm -hmm. everybody was kind of in it. Mm -hmm. and, and now there's a very small percentage of people who serve in the military, a very small percentage who are in Congress, whoever served in the military. And you go back 40 years, that was a group of people in Congress who mostly served in the military. They had an idea of what it was like to go to war, and they had an idea of what the consequences were of getting into one or starting yeah. one. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, back in the um, uh, just a few years ago, well over fifty percent of the uh, folks in Congress had served. I I think I'm hearing the number of less than ten percent now that have served. Very small percent. Uh, switching gears now, they'll get Michael Hormy is back from interims in Parkersburg. I yes. believe you were. What's this hotel you stayed in? Bill's uh, talking Blender about Blender Hassan. Blender Hassan. Blender Hassan Hotel. Um, it was very historic, very nice, um, excellent place. So. I've been to Parkersburg twice, but both times it was to do a football game. We got, kind of got in and got out, so I didn't stay in any hotels. But that, what's the significance of that one? It's really, really old. Um, <laughs> I think I it's was kind really, of an old world sort of treatment yes, as well. They, they, uh, everything's very proper. Everything's kind of from the we, we toured the historic uh, district down there. Houses from the 1850s and 60s, um, big, huge mansions. A lot of these mansions were from the timber. Mm -hmm. um, industry, so they were timber barons, I guess is what you would call them. Um, we got to tour the Parkersburg Community uh, and Technical College for nursing. Um, that was excellent. It's the only the only uh, technical college that can offer four year degrees, which um, I was very impressed with. And, and what were you telling us about the nursing students there? So every single student that we talked to, even though they're in their second, third year, have already been offered a full time job when they're, they're, they come out of there, and and. I'm scared of needles, and I get kind of wheezy in hospitals, but they have these uh, dummies that we watched a, a pregnant dummy give birth, and it was so detailed, it was it could actually puke, it could talk back to the person. When you're saying pregnant dummy, you're actually talking about a non-living non thing, it not a It certainly didn't person. look non-living to me. <laughs> <laughs> it was very realistic. Uh, they were putting catheters in some dummy. Like It was way more than I ever thought. I could handle, um, but it was very, very interesting. They um, did not offer for you to stand in for dummy mountain. <laughs> I, I got out of there as soon as I could. I did not want to see that. And you can you can go the rest of your life without ever mentioning the word catheter again on this show. It, it okay. was uh, yeah, it was definitely interesting. Yeah. Uh, what kind of business did you folks discuss? Did the governor's uh, September thirty uh, special session request come up? Yes, it did come up. Um, well, obviously, we haven't seen it. Uh, we haven't seen the plan. We ha we hear an idea of he wants to do the child care tax credit, and if it, if that's the one that he put in during last session, it didn't really make it out of committee. So I don't know how the body feels about that. Now, um, is there a means test for the child care? I believe there is, mm -hmm. um, but again, we haven't seen it. if it's if it's the same one as the one he had in special. Service, it was very unpopular on both sides of of, of the aisle. Um, I'm talking about House and Senate, not Republicans, Democrats. Uh, but uh, yeah, we haven't seen what he's going to do with this tax cut. It's early. It's September 11th. You got till so, the <laughs> yeah. If, if he waits till the last week, I know the House is not going to be very uh, happy with that. We'd like to look at this in detail and find out how much, how many different appropriations he's looking to do, and why is it so important for the last two months to do a, a special session to appropriate uh, this money. So. Uh, lots of questions still about that. Yeah, you uh, you mentioned off air that you spent some time with Craig Blair and Eric Tarr, and you're talking about specifically about Tarr. Uh, you came away very impressed with him. You know, I, I've always had a pretty good relationship uh, with, with Eric. He's always been very cordial to me. Uh, he's very, very knowledgeable. Eric Tarr, not householder. You mean. Eric Tarr, yeah. uh, householder Obvi too. Obvi obviously, obviously householder. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was it's it's interesting. It, it, he doesn't. He knows that budget as well as anybody, um, and, and we had conversations on how this could happen, what it could happen. Um, 
I just I felt it very interesting. I came away impressed. We, it was a couple hours next to the fire pit. What were his thoughts and what are yours about an additional 5% personal income tax cut that the governor wants to do? Eric Kalsoder texted me yesterday and said that's about a $100 million price tag in addition to the 4% mm-hmm. that the trigger has enacted. You folks could all be put in a difficult position on having to vote for a tax cut before the— uh, and, and then you have to ask yourself, Do does that— take away raises for state employees the following year. How does that affect all of our other appropriations that we're looking for? And why is it so important right this second when we have triggers in place? I think uh, I'm on the side of um, we need to be cautious. Uh, However, I will say this. If you put it, um, put a bunch of Republicans on the board and they have to vote for it, it's going to be very hard not to vote for it. Uh, I think these kind of negotiations can be done behind the scenes. And uh, I would rather see it not go on the board, to tell you, to, just because we don't, I don't know what that plan is either. Mm-hmm. So I haven't read his actual plan and where he's getting this money and what, where it's coming I've been from. told in the interviews we've done that you can't afford a 5% personal income tax cut and a 5% pay raise. Hmm. That would make sense. You you alluded to something. You'd rather things be done sort of behind the scenes. Isn't that the majority of what happens? I mean, the way the sausage is made and, is and that's, behind the scenes, right? It is behind the scenes, but we still haven't seen the negotiated plan. How much how much of the Senate how much how much of the House and the Senate is the governor going to take in, into into account? Um, so without seeing an actual bill. Or, or finding out a plan, it's really hard to answer that question. Um, and, and you have to look at the specifics on ev- every single one of these appropriations. There's been over a billion dollars banked, Mike, between the rainy day fund, set-asides for the personal income tax fund, and whatever. So on the surface, $100 million tax break, $100 million raise, whatever it, whatever it works out to be, uh, would be within... I think the reach of the legislature to to do it, but when you also look at a child ter- child care tax credit, when you also look at what's happening with social services in and and we're West adding Virginia, a third grade uh, success act um, and the increased costs of PEIA, do you have concerns because the recent numbers for the first two months have come out a little flat in terms of the state's revenues meeting or just short of uh, projections? I'm not so, so much concerned about the, the revenues right now. I think uh, you know Eric explained that pretty well. Um, but there are mounting things that are coming, and we still have lots of things we'd like to spend. We have emergency services that we'd like to spend money on. There are lots of other things that we need to do. We need to pay our teachers more. We need to pay um, our counselors more, um, you know, the, the people yeah. in health care. There's, there's lots of things that we are just behind. We're, we're catching up, but let's look at the plan before we make a decision. Mike, building upon that, uh, a tax cut is something that is – inherent to Republicans, something that feels good, something you want to you want to do. And it gets a lot of good political uh, uh, vibes from it. But on an individual basis, have you heard from from folks that many people see the tax cut actually make a difference in the regular life? Oh, I think it does, especially somebody on a fixed income. Uh, I think people will move to West Virginia if we eventually get rid of the income tax. Uh, People that are on a fixed schedule, retired people moving to West Virginia, I think it is important. Um, How much would that be on a on a regular on an average basis? Do you have any idea? Or well, if it was zero, I mean, it, the more people we can get to move to West Virginia, the higher we can get our base, and that that's with these investments into economic development, we're we're trying to get the younger folks to come and work here, good jobs, but with a no but that's low than personal, fixed income, but with a lower or or no income tax, we can get retirees to come here too. And, and, and that is a good thing. But do we want do we want all those folks here in the Eastern Panhandle or do we want them to go to Gilmer and Pocahontas <laughs> County? And we want those... them throughout the state. Okay. Right? I okay. Mean, it, it, we're trying all to... the Jefferson County people we're, will chime yeah. in now. On, we're, we're, uh... tr- we're trying to get them throughout the state, not just the Eastern Panhandle has got its own set of issues. We, we don't have a problem with growth here, but the rest of the state really does. How much so? <laughs> I, I think it... it there's some issues down south. Yeah, but 
is the and and you may well be right on this mike i do not know the numbers so i cannot really rebut one way or the other but are there better ways to encourage growth in the in the state and to improve improve the economy in the state than a cross the board tax cut well, investment into economic development is, is, a, is a great, great exactly way to, right. to, dro- yeah. to dro- drops in, but lower taxes is important, and I think I Im- think it. It's. Can you give me a number of on an average person how much is we're talking about, and how much does over a year would that would make in their what they would like to do with their life? So the average income in West Virginia is what forty seven thousand, right around there forty seven thousand. Mm-hmm. So we cut income tax by twenty one percent. Another four percent is happening right right now. So if you you look at it that way, you're talking a couple of hundred bucks per 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 family. Yeah, I don't. I think the, the the trigger mechanism, I think, is the best way to do it, and is the most responsible way to do it. And we've got the trigger with an additional four uh, percent. The five percent on the top of that, if you're a taxpayer, you're like, yeah, great. Give every dollar I can keep is a dollar that's mine to begin with anyway. That you are yep. not going to take from me. So, I, yeah, well, that's excellent. I, I think where you get into trouble though is when you know the state has additional costs that are coming, like PEIA. And you, you either get out of PEIA, or or you got to make sure you got enough money to cover it. Because you, you if you're not going to get out of PEIA and just privatize everybody's yeah, health insurance, so, you got to pay for we're it. We're in a very good financial position. It's good to have these conversations, but you don't want to put yourself into a position where now, in two, three, four years, I have to vote for a tax increase right. or an additional fee or whatever that is we don't want to be in that position like so. kansas was a few years well, ago and i don't want to i yeah. don't want and to like see that. west virginia was 10 years ago yeah. 12 yeah. years ago yeah. absolutely remember that when there was in, and then they had to go back and they had to tell schools like shepherd uh we're, we're not going to give you an extra yeah. that 20 not million. only that yeah. but we're going to cut in the middle I of mean, your budget year especially higher ed i mean higher ed felt those that pinch even more so i think because you know you're you're mandated to do other things elsewhere mm-hmm. but higher ed you'd just be like let's just let's just cut by two three four percent and so. i think uh i think it also handcuffs uh the new governor mr mr morris a, a we little ha- bit. And yesterday we and, asked him and, about that and he said he would he, he's for tax cuts but he would prefer that this happens during his and, administration for further study and i think he'd downsize a lot of the efficiencies in uh in government in in the agencies i think that's really something that, that patrick would would try and make more efficient so as you make cuts in agencies to to line items now you can start bringing that money back in too so but without saying an actual plan it's really hard to discuss how would you know how would you know right uh, so talk to me about this re- the republican majority is entrenched and it's not going away anytime soon so i agree how much uh, the uh, authority does that give you to try to further government efficiencies to make sure that a dollar taken from you as a tax is not a is not 10 cents that's wasted well if you look at the last special session i think you can kind of see where the senate and house leadership was going we're not looking to blatantly cross line items out. So what they did is they cut some of those line items, but they put them on a special reserve fund that they had to ask for permission to draw it down. So once you drew down a line item 20%, you were then able to go into that reserve fund and say, hey, I need to draw out of that fund. They just had to report monthly why they did it and what they were using it for. And that made it much more efficient. Well, we talked to um, one of the heads of the agencies and they haven't drawn down any of the money. If they don't need it, then they're going to lose it. So there was a line of questioning that if you don't do this soon, you're not going to see that in your next budget. But does that then create the inefficiencies of the use it or lose it mentality, which we see from the federal government at the end of every fiscal year? No, because of the, the stop gaps that they put in. They have to actually have used the money and then have a reason for drawing down from that account. So there are some really good things about that that bill that the house i don't think uh was on board with it to start with but i think uh once we're educated we got we got much better how easy is it for you to get information when you request it from an agency um if you i find on rulemaking review if you give the agency time 
and you do your homework up front. You don't wait till they, they're just sitting before you randomly and you ask them a, a crazy question about how much, you know, what are the last five year projections for your uh, fiscal fiscal um, viability? They don't have that question when you're live with them. But if you go in advance and give them the time to get you the information, the agency will give you everything. If, it, if an agency is budgeted for 50 employees, but because of whatever reason, they only can hire 35 because that's mm -hmm. all they can find, you still have to provide a budget for the 50 employees. What happens to the money that those other 15 employees were budgeted for? So a couple of different ways you can look at this. Firstly, the, the governor is the one that sends the budget out. We just have to approve it and look at it. So when we're in, I've, I'm not on finance, but I sat in on a lot of them. Those are the questions the, the finance committee are asking. How, how many employees are you sure? What, what, how, how many of those positions have not been filled for years? And you'll find there's quite a few positions that haven't been funded for years. And so where did we, the money go? We, the money stays in their account. And that's the the rollover, so like for instance, the Department of Health had a $300 million rollover from last year that they didn't use, um, which they need to start using. And do you eventually at some point along the way cut the budget by? So the governor would have to cut the budget and then we would have to approve it or, or um, not approve it. It's, it's not really the legislator's role to go line item by line item and decide what the budget is. The budget is decided by the governor and then any new appropriations or new new money, we get to approve or disapprove of. So it's really the, the executive branch that's doing a lot of that stuff. But at the end of the year, you look at the budget, and if they if they have not spent money on a certain item, mm -hmm. is a hard question follows. Is it an item which you, as a legislator, should be should be uh, would be pursuing? We we. we we use, and it depends which department built too. Yeah. Uh, it depends on what that line is for. If it's for employees, it's for equipment or things like that, uh, and how they're doing. And that's why that special um, fund was created, so that there's a way to track it all. And end. it does make you wonder if, in terms of personnel, if certain positions have not been filled for X number of months, years, whatever, then if you had those people in those positions, what else would that agency be accomplishing? You know, it's just one yeah. of those. I think there's two ways to look at okay. it. You've got an extra group of folks that you've not fully utilized, but then there's also there's not a, you, the difficulty of recruiting. When I think about our local it, sheriff department. They're always understaffed. It's not because they don't have the work that needs to be done. They just cannot find the, uh, the applicants. Deputies. And, and you look at the Department of Commerce. I mean, they have such a hard time finding auditors in, in people in that field because th those positions in the private sector are paying so much more than yeah, in the public right. sector yeah so it's not always the agency's fault mm -hmm. exactly right yeah. Answer, yeah yeah but for but it's still the nets out the same way you've got money appropriated and that money is supplied by taxpayers and it's not being used so, and, so and certain positions are paid a certain amount and the head of the agency doesn't have the ability sometimes to go okay listen i might be able to have four people here at a higher salary instead of eight at a lower salary. Mm -hmm. And they don't have that ability. You know, one of our local elected officials is doing just that, has uh, streamlined the workforce, but has compensated the other employees by a by, by a pay raise. And it's really paying dividends. Who's that person? I'm not going to say just yet. Oh, you're teasing us, Bill. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. We're, I, we're I don't get, want to embarrass. We're, but I, we're getting an example of efficiency <laughs> that we don't want to expose. Yeah, and there is efficiency in the local government. There is efficiency. Michael, welcome back. Thank you, sir. Thank you kindly.